Welcome back into the Original Gangsters podcast, The OG. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein, along with my partner in crime, my co-conspirator, the doctor, Jimmy Bucciolato. Hi, everyone. Uh, today, we're going to discuss some current events in the New York Mafia, specifically a trial that's going on right now. Uh, it's the murder trial of uh, Bonanno Associate Sal- Sylvester Sally Daz Zatola. And uh, the story behind his murder is quite compelling. And I think uh, at least the, uh, what, we, what we learned throughout this trial in the last month, uh, that the lead up to his murder in 2018 um, really speaks volumes about where we are uh, in, in the mafia in 2022. Um, and we, we, we talked a little bit about Mikey Nose Mancuso a couple weeks ago when we were discussing the funeral, um, the, the funeral parlor brawl that broke, uh, uh, broke out within the Bonanno crime family. Now we're kind of going to go back into this uh, perennial dysfunction junction of the <laughs> Bonanos, and we're going to talk about the, the, the Sally uh, Zatola murder the trial uh, where his son is on trial for for uh, ordering his murder, and then we're going to discuss what our thoughts on uh, Mikey knows as as a boss. And I'll 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 tease it out a little bit right now. I think Mikey knows Mancuso right now, who's been the boss of the Bananos for ten years. He was acting boss before that, uh, pushing seventy years old right now. I, I think the guy is making a very strong argument for being one of the worst. Uh, La Cosa Nostra bosses, uh, at least in in terms of the five families, um, he, he it seems like every move he makes is very divisive and uh, causes more harm than than um, produces positive results. But uh, before we do that, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass it on to my uh, my homeboy Jimmy here, and we're gonna talk about some of our uh, polls that we've done recently, and then we're gonna uh, deep dive uh, Sally Daz. Yeah. So um, thanks everyone for following us on social media. Please. Subscribe to us, our YouTube channel. Subscribe to us on audio, um, you know, Spotify, whatever, however you listen to us, Apple. And please follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, we try to um, – we read all of the comments regardless, but we, we don't always respond to all of them. Just we don't always have time, but we, we definitely follow them and we appreciate that. And another way we've been trying to engage with – our audiences through our YouTube channel and the polls. And we talked about the one a few weeks ago with the TV show, Sopranos, Sons of Anarchy, etc. And so the last two that we, we posted, we'll just spend a few minutes talking about this. Uh, we asked, which American crime family outside of New York is the most compelling? And so your choices were the Bruno Scarfo family in Philly, the Magadino family in Buffalo, the outfit in Chicago, Patriarcha family in New England and the Tokos really family in Detroit. It's a no brainer. Yeah, the the results were Chicago number one. Oh, really? Yeah. See, I, to me, it's a no brainer and pointing towards Philadelphia. They were number two, and by far, I mean those two received the most votes by far. Um, Detroit was three, Patriarcha was four, and Magadino was at was at the very end with only three percent. I mean, we're fascinated by Detroit because that's kind of been our bread and butter, and that's where we kind of made our bones as. Um, crime reporters and mafia historians, but honestly, like, at least if you're studying, you know, the modern day, day to day machinations of the mafia, the De- Detroit mob is the least interesting. They're so stable and under the radar and um, functional that, you know, the dysfunction kind of finds its nooks and crannies. But uh, yeah, that's a good I, question. I guess it depends on like how you contextualize. But Philadelphia the is, is such a, um, Soap opera that's been going on now for forty years. Um, I just it's like a it's like a train wreck. You just can't look away from. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, like if you're just talking about right now, then I think it's Philadelphia or maybe Buffalo. <laughs> believe it or not, if you're talking about right now. Oh yeah, if you're talking about right now, <laughs> Buffalo is is right in that conversation. Right, but historically, I'm I'm biased. I'm I'm going with Detroit and. Um, but but I yeah maybe it's maybe that's because of my even Chicago you know, I think Chicago falls under that same umbrella as Detroit right now, and it's a tribute to the to the leadership of those families. Uh, you know Chicago has been pretty low key sure. since uh, Mikey Sarno went away to a uh, fat Mike Sarno went away uh, went away to prison in 2010. It's been 12 years of 
you know, relative silence. I mean, there was one kind of some somewhat big case out of the Grand Avenue crew with Bobby Pinocchio, Pinozo. Um, you know, there was a couple associates that were close to the DeFranzos that got tied up in some stuff, but yeah, it's been pretty. Hasn't, there hasn't been a mob murder there in over over ten years, and um, I don't think it. I don't think it really compares to what, what we have going on right now uh, in Philadelphia or Buffalo. And uh, I know Ben, you're off mic, but do you have a vote for for one of those five? I do. This is way out of my. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. That's okay. That's fair Ben's enough. Just like I'm a producer. I'm yeah, that to make you guys sound good. That's fair enough. So then the second qu- poll we uh, put out there recently: Who is your favorite Sun Belt Mafia Don? So your choices were Carlos Marcello from New Orleans, Joe Bonanno Tucson, uh, Joe Savello from Dallas, Nick Licata Los Angeles, or Santo Traficante from Tampa. Uh, the results: uh, Santo Traficante ran away with it with almost fifty percent. Carlos from New Orleans comes in second, Joe Bonanno a distant third, and then Savello and Licata with only 1% each. So. You know, I have to say that this is, this is just my impression, and I've, I've been wrong before, but I sense that this vote and this poll and, and giving the nod to Traficante, not that he's not deserving, but I, I sense it might have something to do with Donnie Brasco. Mm. Just in the in the in the in the manner that he wasn't a major figure in the movie Donnie Brasco, but he if you watch that movie and that's a movie that is on television quite a bit, um, and if you watched it when it first came out, um, you know there's a storyline in there about Traficante, and you see Al Pacino and Michael Madsen and Johnny Depp all kind of I don't want to say how cowing to to Traficante, but Telling the audience how important he was. Right. So I don't think there really is a movie or something from pop culture that gave people kind of an entree to, to Marcello or Bonanno. I mean, everybody knows who Joe Bonanno is, so that maybe doesn't um, apply that. But Savillo, Nakata, Marcello. Marcello was huge. I mean, he was the mob boss of New Orleans and, and pulled a lot of strings. But I just, I feel like anybody that saw Donnie Brasco and retained, you know, the facts from that movie, came away thinking that Santo Traficante was a pretty big deal, and that might have colored some of the uh, some of the poll results. Yeah, I would say, I thought maybe Marcelo would top this only because of the JFK. Like, he's just, everyone, if, you're, if you subscribe to the idea that the mafia played a role in killing JFK, although they would say Traficante was also involved, but, but Marcelo, is, Marcelo is usually the... The, the ringleader there. I'm going to go with, and this is, again, I'm biased. I'm going with Joe Bonanno. And uh, I, I, as my specialization, my primary research interest is anything Castellamarese. And that's where my family's from. And, uh, you know, Ben, you, you can hit the siren. <laughs> Joe Bonanno's baptismal godfather was my ancestor, Feligi Bucciolano. <laughs> so I have I went down to Tucson and met with Rosalie Bonanno and I, you know, had a you know friendly relationship with them. So uh I'm going going with JB. Um although he was you know he was from New York. He was exiled to yeah. Tucson, but he had a he had a family down there. I don't think it was recognized by the commission, but he had it was, a, know, it was more of a crew. I think so. Glorified crew, like, like the Sopranos, yeah. But I would go with JB. But I mean, I, I can't argue with Traficante. I mean, he's a good. He's. I mean, he was. He was seems more important than the size of his family. Same thing with with Carlos Marcello too in New Orleans. Like those guys carried a lot of weight for not having really large right. families with a lot of soldiers and things like that. But those guys, but especially think, Traficante, I mean, he was a major heroin. I think uh, in the fifth, importer. I think in the fifties and sixties though. The, the the Tampa family and the New Orleans family probably had fifty guys. Oh, okay. I don't think you were ever talking a situation where they had ten. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that's yeah, that's decent. But both size. of those families have disappeared since their titular, uh, since their the the faces of the franchise, if you will, um, died. And they yeah, both, uh, Santo died in the late eighties. Uh, Carlos Marcello died in the early nineties, and. Uh, there's still mob activity in Florida in New or- and New Orleans, but it's more um, disparate. I think uh, other families have, have come in and, and planted flags. I know in New Orleans, 
the Columbos and the Gambinos have operations going on down there. And then in Florida, it, you know, it's always been a somewhat of a no man's land. And now right. probably even more so that there's not really a, a a home crime family. Yeah, that was the point, Donnie Brasco, that they when they wanted to set up shop down there, they had to check in with Traficante and get his blessing just to keep things copacetic politically. But uh, Savello, I mean, there were some comments that Savello, I, I'm not an expert, that Savello was technically a captain under New Orleans. Was he? Was Dallas not even its own? I mean, he, they, they, they got a family. They, they got an invite to uh, Appalachian. So okay, when maybe someone can. Res- well, when this episode drops, someone check in with us because um, there was some feedback that maybe he he wasn't even he wasn't no, I don't think his own di- boss. No, in terms of the size of family, I think even if Dallas was recognized as a family at that time, they did not. They didn't have thirty, forty guys. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Um, and, and maybe, um, maybe he was. Uh, Either way, they were close with New Orleans. I know they were close with New Orleans. And you think of Dallas, Jack Ruby. I don't know. It's kind of interesting to me. Final thing I'll say, I mean, it, it goes down to the the way you want to, you want to analyze it and the metrics. But if we're talking about Joe Bonanno, I mean, he was one of the founding fathers of the cause of Nostra. Sure, like, sure. Yeah. He was a boss of one of the five families. So. Yeah, when he was a young man. Right. So I, obviously he, in terms of um, beginning – to end, yeah, and you know the full career. Banano ran <laughs> circles, of course, around everyone else in this poll. But I if we're so. just talking about Banano's time in yeah. Arizona as a kind of deposed New York mafia boss sent to to the Southwest, to, I don't know if he was sent to the Southwest. He, he kind of took. He already had a crew down there. He took refuge. Yeah, yeah, because he had already had a crew. He already had some guys down there because, uh, and that's you know, Bill went down there for college and things like that. But and Lakata, we'll just say one last thing. Lakata, I think he's interesting at, largely because of the Detroit <laughs> connection. He was close to, the, and actually, was was Nick Lakata ever in Detroit? Yeah. So the story of Nick, so. the story of Nick Lakata was that uh, he he made his bones as a mob guy in Detroit. Uh, worked for Toko and Zerilli uh, early on in the Toko Zerilli regime, had some type of falling out with Joe Zerilli, uh, and was kicked out of town. Went to California and climbed the ladder in California for the next 20 years to the point where he became uh, a capo and then an underboss. And people in Detroit were made aware that eventually Nick Licata is going to be the boss of Los Angeles. And it was, you know, in everyone's best interest to quell any lingering tensions. And uh, from from my research, Nick Licata wasn't just kicked out of Detroit, but Zerilli had put a murder contract on his head. Wow. Uh, Dragna had got it removed. But uh, come the 1950s, when it became obvious that Nick Licata was – eventually going to take over um, the Detroit family and the L.A. family decided to marry off uh, Black Bill Toko's daughter to Nick Licata's son, uh, Carl Licata, and that was a way to bury the hatchet and make everything right again. And uh, you had this um, convoy, I guess, of... of, uh, West Coast mafia dignitaries that that came into Detroit and offered up Carlo Licata <laughs> as as kind of the olive branch to to the to the uh, Tocos Rillies. and then anybody that's followed uh, Jimmy and I's reporting and uh, on the show, you can then fast forward another thirty years, uh, twenty five years, and Carlo Licata had probably had something to do with the Jimmy Hoffa disappearance, just in the sense that he most likely gave his house. To the Jackalones to use as the as the uh, location of the hit, and then and then he was he ended up dead on the six year anniversary, um, almost to the minute. And uh, there's a lot of people that think that he was killed as a some type of message uh, that he was trying to leverage his knowledge of of the of the Hoffa uh, conspiracy against his brother in laws, the Tokos. Now uh, we'll just wrap up after this, but. You you were close with Tony Z, <clears throat> excuse me, at, toward the end of his life, and he had dealings out in California. Did he have any thoughts about Nick Licata? Did he ever comment on that? Well, he Did definitely he... confirmed my suspicions that 
Carl Okada was murdered. <laughs> okay. um, he told me uh, him and his wife had run into Carl Okada 24 or 48 hours before he was found dead at a bank and uh, said that he was in really good spirits. Mm-hmm. Um, and the notion that he would have you know, killed himself is, to mm-hmm. them, laughable. Um, what about the old man, though, Tony Z? When he would go out to California when he was younger. So, yeah, so, Tony, Nick- so there, there was a very uh, symbiotic relationship between the Detroit family and what was going on on the West Coast. Uh, Jack Dragna, uh, Momo uh, Adamo. And uh, Tony's really actually <laughs> told a pretty crazy story. And these are so many great anecdotes that just we'll never see the light of day in book form because he died and we had to put the project to bed. But uh, he took his honeymoon to Los Angeles. And I think he spent two or three weeks there. And according to Tony Z, when he was on his honeymoon in Los Angeles, the uh, L.A. crime family was having trouble uh, taking care of uh, some business. And uh, either Joe Zarelli called Tony in L.A. or Momo Adamo, who was the underboss, um, approached Tony. I'm not sure of the order of operation here. But uh, according to Tony Z, he was given a murder contract on his honeymoon that he carried out on behalf of the L.A. crime family in 1949. <laughs> wow. Um, Some honeymoon. <laughs> so, and he, uh, he says that, uh, he told me that when he, uh, they, they, they went by train, and he said that uh, they were met at the train station by a group of L.A. mafia uh, administrators led by Momo Adamo, and that uh, Tony Z had been given a rare box of Cuban cigars mm. from Joe Zarelli to give to uh, Momo, uh, two, I guess two boxes, one for Momo Adamo and one for Jack Dragna. Mm. Let's do, let's see, will people respond on social media when you hear this. If you want us to do an old school L.A. crime family episode, let us know. I'd like to. I think it's fun. Um, well, it's just the L.A. is such a, a great you know, part of the country and there's so much color to Los Angeles, but... You know, the mafia there has always been, you know, dubbed the Mickey Mouse Mafia or, <laughs> right, you know, it's right. always been kind of looked down upon. Yeah. And there's reasons for it. Mm-hmm. Well, I think, though, um, and again, getting into how pop culture colors things or influences things, you know, the portrayal of Jack Dragna in the movie Bugsy oh, does right. not do any justice right. to what was really going on in L.A. Jack Dragna was no pushover. Yeah. And in that movie, they make it look like he, well, he's humiliated. Yeah, in that and, and they embarrass him in in, in multiple scenes. And, and one scene, he actually uh, Bugsy makes him get on the ground and bark like a dog. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that that wasn't uh, historically accurate. So anyhow, we'll we'll try to put out some more polls and and see what you guys think. But let's get back to the lead the lead topic with um, Mancuso. You want you want to give uh, a background on the, the the murder and and yeah. So uh, Sylvester Zatola. Long-time New York Mafia associate, multimillionaire, uh, had uh, had a, a vending machine, Joker poker, real estate empire fortune. Uh, it was worth tens of millions of dollars. I think they they uh, estimated his estate at like fifty million bucks. And uh, starting in the ni- early nineteen eighties. He developed a very close relationship with Vinnie Gorgeous, uh, Vincent Basciano, who was a high riser, fast riser in the Bonanno crime family. Someone that I think, if his time on the street would have lasted longer, would have been a household name uh, in America because he had that John Gotti quality to him and uh, was probably considerably more likable than, than John Gotti. Uh, but his uh, time on, on top only lasted a couple years and then he was brought down by Joe Massino, who was his boss, who, you know, wired up. Uh, and, I, and we can talk about that. I've said it before. I don't like the idea of the government making deals with the boss to then go take down the smaller fish. I agree. The whole point is to take the smaller fish and go get the bigger fish. So uh, uh, Vinny Basciano and, and Sally Daz, I'm not sure where the nickname Daz came from. I know that uh, Daz was the name of his his vending machine real estate company, but I'm not sure wh- wh- what the nickname um, implies or what it means. But uh, 
Sally Daz and Vinny Bastiano were very close friends, more than just an uh, associate that gets protection from a mobster. They socialized together. Their families went on vacation together. Uh, Vinny Bastiano actually used Zatola to purchase a house for his girlfriend. So when like his guma? for his guma when uh, when Bastiano was um, not with his wife, he was with his girlfriend, and it was a piece of property that I believe was owned by Sally Daz, and Sally Daz might have lived close to it, and Bastiano would have most of his meetings with Sally Daz at this house, and um, Sally Daz was giving Bastiano and the Bonanno crime family literally. Millions and millions of dollars in protection for 30 to 40 years. I mean, this is the way the mafia is supposed to work, that the tens of millions of dollars that you're giving to the mob for protection is supposed to buy you said protection. So Vinny Bastiano goes, goes away to prison in the mid-2000s. Uh, Zatola, at that time, was still paying some form of tribute. He, at that point, also was doing some business with the Lucchese's. But, DeLuca, I think, was the guy. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> all of a sudden, in the late 2010s, he becomes a target for assassination. And nobody knew, no, at the time, nobody knew why. And it was getting a lot of publicity in the New York media because he averted five separate hits on him uh, where he was shot. He was stabbed. Uh, there was a very, very concerted effort over a two or three year period to murder him. And Wasn't one of them caught on surveillance? Yes, one was caught on surveillance. Yeah. Um, and nobody knew where it was coming from and why it was happening, but it was, again, getting a lot of publicity. And eventually he is murdered in a McDonald's drive-through in the Bronx. A lot of this is happening in the Bronx. Uh, Vinny Bastiano was from the Bronx. Sally Daz was from the Bronx. Uh, he was uh, getting a, a cup of coffee at the drive-through. The, the hit team had a GPS on his car and followed him or found him at the McDonald's, blocked him in and, and shot him dead uh, at the drive-through window. It eventually comes out that all this was being done by his son. Uh, he had two sons. Uh, I think it's Salvatore, Salvatore and Anthony. Salvatore and Anthony. Anthony was the one that it turns out, according to the prosecutors, was the mastermind that he uh, farmed out this hit to members of the Bloods, uh, United Blood Nation, UBN, um, which is the L.A. Bloods, uh, the incarnation of the L.A. Bloods in on the East Coast is called UBN. Yeah, they're big out yeah. there. Big in prison, too. Yeah. Uh, OG Mac um, and I think OG Deadeye were the two guys that, that, that brought, the, brought the bloods to New York. And um, the trial's going on right now. And it's uh, Anthony Zatola and uh, a number, or I, maybe w one of the hitters and then the other hitters are witnesses and have, have flipped. But what I found most fascinating by what has come out at this trial, and this is where we get into Mikey Knows Mancuso, was last week the prosecutors played phone, uh, phone conversations that had been intercepted uh, on Vinny Bastiano's prison phone. And Vinny Bastiano is in Supermax right now, down in Florida. That's where the worst of the worst are kept. He's being kept there because he tried to put murder contracts on the head of judges and prosecutors, which is, will always right. get you slammed yeah. uh, by Uncle Sam. But uh, you see pictures of him that, that, that get circulated out, that, that uh, make its way. He still looks from, good. <laughs> still, you know, he's a guy that, Vinny, you know, Vinny Gorgeous, uh, let's just talk a second about the reputation. Right. I mean, he was a guy that thought very highly of himself, was very um, enamored by his appearance. He you was know, a good-looking guy, ladies' uh, man. Yeah, you know, ladies' man. <laughs> always dressed to the nines. His hair was always perfect. Remind yeah. me of the song from uh, the Werewolf of London. Oh, and yeah. his hair was perfect. <laughs> yeah, right. that was Vinny Bastiano, um, and really fancied himself a, a modern-day John Gotti. 
uh, and uh, played the played the role. It, it, he had uh, a number of beauty parlors and and uh, barber shops, and one of them was called Hello Gorgeous, and that's where he got the nickname <laughs> Vinnie Gorgeous. Um, but it's not surprising when you hear this, but nobody knew this until a week or two ago that while this you know two year you know just crazy mob murder odyssey is playing out and and Sally Daz is dodging literally dodging bullets he's and it makes sense he's reaching out to his rabbi and his his rabbi is Vinny Bastiano and they played a number of phone calls that took place in, in 2017 and uh, parts of 18, he was killed in 18, between Bastiano, uh, Sally Daz, and then Sally Daz's son, Salvatore. And Simone Bastiano is saying, this is not right. You know, uh, you paid us all this money. We have to protect you. You're my friend. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to call Mikey Nose. Now, Mikey Knows Mancuso, who's the boss of the Bananos, was appointed acting boss of the Bananos, which was the stepping stone to boss the Bananos, by Vinny Bastiano. And <laughs> Mikey Mancuso reached out on more, than one of a, on more than one occasion to Mikey Mancuso. Bastiano did. What did I say? You said Mancuso. All right, let's start over again. <laughs> Vinny Bastiano reached out on more than one occasion to Mikey Knows Mancuso on behalf of Sally Daz and said, you need to protect Sally Daz. He's given us all this money. He's my friend. He's, he's practically family to me. I'm locked up. I can't do anything. You need to step in right now. And Mikey Mancuso refused to, to lift a finger, refused to acknowledge Sally Daz as, as, as an associate, as someone that had paid his crime family tens of millions of dollars over the years, refused to send word to the street that, you know, nobody is to touch this guy. And if anybody touches this guy again, it's, you're going to be hearing from me. Um, and in fact, stopped responding to Vinnie Gorgeous altogether. And as a result, there was nothing Sally Daz could do because his son was intent on murdering him. And, you know, the sixth, the sixth time was the charm. And, and they hit him. And they killed him. And I'm just, I'm really shocked. I, I'm not shocked that these conversations were taking place because it makes sense. But I'm shocked to learn that there was zero urgency from the Mancuso camp. And he will, it appears that he was totally okay with an associate on record with his crime family that had paid just an unbelievable amount of money to that crime family over the years. He was totally okay with hanging him out to dry. And a guy was close with the boss. The right. real, I mean, the real the boss. The former boss. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm, I was just kind of in shock. Now, again, not that these conversations were taking place, but what the result of these conversations were. That Mancuso wouldn't even give Vinny Bastiano or Sally Daz the time of day. So what's the point? Really, what's the point? Of paying protection. I mean, this guy, I mean, we're, we're not, again, I, I know I've said this 20 times already. He probably paid this crime family $30, 40000000 million. <laughs> yeah, over the decades. Yeah. And, and another thing that came out was that Eventually, Salvatore, the son, realizes the Bananos aren't going to protect them. So he he actually hires a private security mm -hmm. firm, which obviously that didn't work either. But there, but it's just kind of an interesting point of you're paying all this money, and then on top of it, you've got to hire private security because the Bananos aren't going to aren't going to step in. Now it seems like Bashiano was asking questions like who do you think this is who do you think's behind this and there's even some if if you if you want to you know intimate that Bastiano might have realized this is coming from his yes, own family right, right yeah like he right he was sort of if you decode like he it seems like he was suspecting well, cuz he was asking because Salvatore's saying I don't know I have we have no idea and Bastiano's like well what about Anthony. what about your brother <laughs> right and then we learned from those snippets of conversation 
that there had been a huge rift between Anthony and Sally Daz. Uh, and and they're talking about it. Bastiano is talking about it with um with Salvatore. And Salvatore saying, I, I don't know, whenever I bring up my dad to my brother, my brother shuts down. They haven't spoken in a long time. Yeah. Uh, but but the end game for Anthony Zatola was the forty five, fifty million dollar real estate Joker Poker Empire that that uh his dad was was in control of or owned. So let me let me put this out there and see what you think. Um I don't know if this is a devil's advocate. Maybe I don't know how to frame this, but so you traditionally when you, when you pay protection to they're paying protect, protection to the bananas, the, the idea is that it's protection from not only other bananas, <laughs> but, but the other five families or, or anybody. Right. But that's my question. Is that, does that hold or is it just for, um, because this came up in our episode last week with about Boris and the Russians that the Russian guy is paying protection to the Italians and but he's paying protection from other Italians but when the Russians try to shake him down the same Italians intervene and Boris is like hey don't, this none is your this is none of your business this is between the Russians so what you know what i mean like what's the protocol here i, I mean under what my impression is and from interviewing all these guys over the years and getting as close to the flame as it, as it possibly can, as you possibly can be without <laughs> actually being burned. a mob guy or getting burned. And I actually have been burned <laughs> once or twice. Um, you're paying protection from, from anybody and anything. Okay. Uh, I mean, I suppose there are exceptions, but I don't think, I think we're giving Mancuso to, if that was the case, and that you were only getting protection from other mobsters. I think we're giving Mancuso too much credit. I don't think Mancuso realized that this was coming from. Oh, I see. From his kid, he just didn't care. He just didn't give a shit. He's yeah. not a made guy. I see. He didn't take an oath. He's not my guy. Right. He's my predecessor's guy. Right. And and to Bastiano's point, I'm I'm sorry. I keep wanting to Mancuso's point, not Bastiano. I, when I get confused with the names, yeah. You know, now you're, now you're right. <laughs> uh, to to Mancuso's point, if you were going to make the argument for Mancuso, he's probably saying, "Yeah, he paid all that money to the family. I didn't see any of it." Uh huh. Yeah. Right. Right. You think Joe Massino saw? <laughs> Rusty Rustelli saw. <laughs> right. Vinny Basciano saw. I didn't see any of it. So why am I loyal to him? Yeah, that's that's some fucking cutthroat. <laughs> That's well, that's Mikey. Shit. That's Mikey knows Mancuso, man. Right, and and but it's also very telling politically that even if that's how Mancuso really felt, but you would think Bastiano still had enough juice and respect, yes, right? That Mancuso would honor his, uh, which is going to the point <laughs> that I don't think Mikey Mancuso is a is a is a barely competent mob boss, right? I mean, he is like it seems that every protocol is being broken in, in the Mancuso regime. Right. Especially what we're learning in the last couple months. Right. With the, and, and for people that um, might not remember, Jimmy, and I'm interested actually, let's get Jimmy's um, insight into this because Jimmy wasn't on that episode with us. But about a month ago, we did a, 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 a super, kind of like a mafia super friends <laughs> we got oh yeah we got the OG <laughs> together with John Panisi and uh, Dave Stratweiser yeah uh, of New York and Philadelphia respectively and we broke down what happened at this funeral uh, where Mikey Mancuso tells uh, a a shelved Bonanno wise guy named Joe Camerano little Joe Joe C little Joe Saunders whose dad Joe Saunders Joe Camerano had been. You know, one of Messino's top guys. Uh, I think at one time, uh, Joe Saunders was underboss or conciliary. He's dead, but his son, little Josie, uh, became acting boss of the Bananos when Mikey Mancuso was in prison and tried to, to, to take power away from Mancuso and uh, pulled the capos, uh, asked all the captains in the family if they wanted Mancuso to stay as boss or if they wanted to move uh, him from acting boss 
to legit uh, to, to the full time boss. That never and it, it never happened. turns out well. Yeah, <laughs> did with the Columbos, right? It, <laughs> it, it turned into a, a war in the right. Columbos, and right. uh, it, it nothing positive happened in this situation either. Uh, one of Mancuso's guys, Johnny Palazzolo, goes back to. Mancuso and says, hey, just so you know, your acting boss is trying to take power away from you. Yeah, being subversive. So Mancuso reassembles the administration, shelves uh, Joe Camerano Jr. And Joe Camerano Jr., from what I hear, uh, is working a a regular nine-to-five job right now. Mm -hmm. Um, And is living his life as a civilian. He was married to the daughter of a capo named Vito Grimaldi. Uh, Vito Grimaldi was someone that was in charge of a lot of the uh, Sicilian yeah. faction in right. the Bananos. And because of what Joe Camerano had done, uh, Joe Camerano Jr. had done, Mancuso also shelved Vito Grimaldi. So these are, Grimaldi and Camerano Jr. are not in the crime family anymore. Oh, well, they're in the crime family, but they're, but they're, on, the they're on the bench. right. Vito Grimaldi dies at the end of the summer, and Mikey Mancuso sends word to Joe Camerano Jr. saying, you are not allowed to go to the funeral. And if you go to the funeral, you're going to be physically assaulted. (laughs) Right. And Joe Camerano Jr. says, no one's going to tell me that I can't go to my own father-in-law's funeral. And, oh, by the way, for the last... 30 years, 40 years, me, my dad, and my brother have been the liaison to the bikers. Outlaw bikers, right. So I'm going to bring with me a bunch of bikers. (laughs) Right. So Joe Camerano Jr. shows up at the the funeral and the uh, wake of his father-in-law. He goes to the casket to pay his respects and within 10 seconds is jumped by Mikey Mancuso's soldiers. Well, the Camerano camp was prepared for this, and there was a, a van full of bikers in the parking lot that get word, I don't know how, someone texted, or, and within another five or ten seconds, the bikers are in the funeral parlor, <laughs> and there's an all-out brawl going on between the bikers <laughs> and the Bonanno soldiers. In front of the casket. <laughs> in, in front of the casket, and the bikers won. Yeah. And, and Mikey Mancuso's soldiers got their asses kicked. So this has been percolating for the last month. Nobody knows what, what the fallout is going to be. There's a lot of people that think that Mikey Mancuso, the only way he can save face here is if he puts out a hit on, on Joe Camerano Jr. Um, it's just a total mess. Just, again, this is the epitome of dysfunction, and, it, and, it's, and it's on brand for the Bananos. So, I mean, Mikey Mancuso is, it's, it's, is having a bad year. Yeah, these are two really big black eyes on his, you know, in terms of his regime and his leadership yeah. or lack of, lack of leadership. And my understanding is Camerano, maybe, maybe he wasn't popular enough to, to, to win that poll, but my understanding is that he's a, he was a popular guy. And, and, his, well, da- and, well his, liked. and his dad was beloved. And Grimaldi, too, that they were. Yeah. Uh, so this is, that sort of just adds to the... Looks like bad form, yeah. for Mancuso to really pile on here. So I'm interested in your insight on this. Like, so on one on one hand, if you're Mikey Mancuso, you're kicking these two guys out of your crime family. I don't want to have anything to do with you guys anymore. So wouldn't couldn't you argue? You've kicked them out. You've put them on the shelf. What right do you then have to say when Vito Grimaldi dies? Hey, you can't do this or you can't do that. You've already. You've already made your play, and that play was to shelve him. Right. And now you don't really have any authority over him. If he was still your soldier, if he was still your capo, right. you would have authority over yeah, him. Yeah, because that's the chain of command. Yeah. But in, the, in this situation, it seems right that uh, at this point, it's none of his business. And it's also bad form in the sense of, you know, especially with Italians and Catholicism and the funeral of this, you know, disgraziato. <laughs> it seems like a, a very, like, disgraceful was, thing to do. This was his know? family. Right. I, I think it might be also right. different. Let's just say uh, a capo, a non-shelved capo of the Bonanno crime family dies and there's a wake. Right. Then maybe Mikey Mancuso has the juice or the right 
to say to Camerano and Grimaldi, don't show up. But yeah. this was family. This was Joe Camerano Jr.'s father-in-law. Right. He, he can't go with his wife to his, his wife's dad's funeral? No, I, I agree. It's, 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 um, I would say it's, uh, at that point, it's, it's none of his business. But let's say, to your point, that or, or a hypothetical, like let's say he wasn't on the shelf and Mancuso was mad about something and said, you don't have a right to go there. That's the chain of command. And he defies him anyhow. You still don't cause a scene at the funeral. Right. You just say, okay, motherfucker. Right. All right, you're going to defy me? And then he gets it <laughs> He gets yeah. it a week, two weeks, three months what later. If it, when what if it's later that afternoon? Right, right, right. That's Why does he, it have to go down right. in the funeral home right. in Long Island yeah. in front of, I'm sure there were a lot of people there that have nothing to do with the mafia. Right. Yeah, that's, and that's you're just, bizarre. You're just all your dirty laundry is being no right. You you put would, on blast. You wouldn't you wouldn't even if he had the right. You wouldn't handle it there. You would wait until after on neutral territory somewhere. Um, so yeah, these are two big black eyes on his record as a in terms of a, his regime. But I, I would ask, I'd go back to something else with the with the protection. Like, who are you paying protection from? Um, as it turns out, though, it is technically. Another associate trying to kill Sally D. It's his own son. But my understanding is that Anthony was also an associate. So then that gets back to the point of his protection money should have entitled him, right? Regardless if it's his own son or not, it is an associate. So it's not like he was, it's not like um, the Hells Angels were trying to assassinate Sally D. Or, I don't know, the Russians or whoever the fuck, right? Because in that sense, you might say, well, we're only, we're only protecting you from other Italians. We're not, we're not going to get involved if, if, you know, whoever else is after you. In this case, it was another, it was an internal thing. And after what? What did you say? Five or six assassination attempts? Five. The, the sixth time got him. It, it was- seems to me that if Mancuso was the boss... It seems like that would have been plenty of time for him to gather enough intel from the streets <laughs> to have to have a pretty good sense that it might be the son who's doing this. I'm not close enough to the situation. Maybe I'm, you know, talking out of my ass here. But doesn't it seem to you that like the boss of anyone should have been able to get to the bottom of this? Like with his all his resources, people on the street, like Tell me, who the fuck do you think this is? Who who's behind this? If Bastiano had an inkling yeah. that it was that it was his, that it was why, Anthony, why why would Mancuso couldn't have figured that and out? And why wasn't Mancuso at, at the very least reaching out to Vinny in prison yeah. and having a conversation between two bosses right. about whether or not they should get involved or shouldn't get involved? But for Mancuso to just ignore yeah. Bastiano, it's almost more disrespectful, right. or it's equally disrespectful than ignoring Sally Daz. Yeah, right. Yeah, more if so. not yeah, more, more so, so yeah. because... Right, right, more so. And and uh, we should also point out that Bastiano and Mancuso were indicted and convicted of the same murder, Randy Pozzolo, uh, from, I believe, 04. Or they were convicted in 04, I'm not sure when the hit took place. I don't remember. Someplace in the early 2000s. And um, Mancuso pled out and got 15 years right. and just walked out of prison in the last couple of years. Right. Uh, and Bastiano went to trial, got convicted, and is doing life. But it's right. the same case. I know. And, and, and Bastiano, I think, gave the contract to Mancuso, who gave the contract to, to the hitters. But it was a guy that um, was kind of a loudmouth wannabe, was really... Uh, Obsessed with getting a button and had uh, gotten close with Bastiano, closer to Bastiano, and I think was doing some construction work on Bastiano's house and the construction work was, was shoddy. Mm. And when he was kind of asked to, to fix it, he had some kind of a smart, smart aleck response <laughs> and, and he got he got killed for it. Had a, had a big mouth and was, I guess, running his mouth about things he shouldn't have been. And then the issue at the house with the construction, I think, might have been the final straw. Wow. So it's not even really that gangster. <laughs> like right. the, the situation of... <laughs> you should have cocked that toilet. 
<laughs> what, what's that from? What's that? Oh, I see. I thought it was a reference from Roberto's in the and, house. And let's, just, and let's just also point out Mikey Mancuso, the type of individual he is, the type of human being he is. Uh, he went to prison for over a decade for killing his wife. So this isn't, you know, this is not a well adjusted, uh, not, <laughs> not a very sane, um, stable individual. So maybe it's not uh, crazy to say. Get ten years. Right. I, I think they they said it was a manslaughter, um, but his wife uh, they killed him in an argument, and he left her like on a park bench next to the hospital. This happened in like eighty four, I think. Well, yeah, if if we have a little bit of time left, what what is Mancuso's what, what's his like bio? What's his background? How did so, he get to how did he rise through the ranks? So he came up in the Purple Gang. That's what I thought. Not the obviously not the Detroit Purple Gang, but right. in New York in the 1970s, uh guys from Harlem and the Bronx, younger guys uh came together and and you know, we don't really have it in Detroit. So it's foreign to us, but in a lot of these other cities, they have what I would categorize as as farm systems. Oh yeah, right. You know, junior varsity, yeah, mob clans, yeah, or 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 or, or crews or gangs that are feeder programs for the mafia, and a a, the, a lot of alumni of those gangs will be bosses in the five families, mm-hmm. and I think each each um. Each family has kind of their own handful of, of feeder groups. So the Purple Gang uh, became uh, feeders for uh, the Genovese and the Bananos. I think that used to be the case in Chicago, too. Sorry yeah, to interrupt. I think they still, Chicago still has some. Okay, okay. Um, I know the C-Notes mm-hmm. is one. Yeah, they're almost like a street gang, but yeah. Italian guys. Grand, Grand, a- Grand Avenue, C-Notes. It's like half uh, Hispanic, half right. Italian. right. Well, they work really closely with the Grand Avenue West Side crew. Mm-hmm. Um, but so so Mancuso came up as a hitter. Um as a hitter, as a as a as a hitman with, with the Purple Gang in the late 70s. And um eventually we're gonna have Scott Dietschy on to talk about his book um that he just wrote that just came out all about the New York Purple Gang. And they they took their moniker from the Detroit guys, which are Hit the can hit the siren, Ben. Yeah. My my relatives, <laughs> uh, and um, and then I actually, but uh, let me. I always it always goes back to a, a, a personal Bernie anecdote, but uh, you know I don't know. I've never met Mikey Knows Mancuso, um, but I did have a minor interaction <laughs> with him, or at least his. People or his really? team. I don't remember this. Uh, a year or two ago, he shut down my website. Uh, Mikey Mancuso uh, had his in, either him or his kid or his grandkid. I don't know. They were upset with a story that I had done. Um, I think it was a story where I was comparing and contrasting purple gangs. I was like. Detroit Purple Gang, New York Purple Gang. Was that something like trivial that he was mad about? He too, was mad it? about a, there was a prison photo <laughs> okay, I that I had remember that this. I had put on the post, and it was like a it was like a mugshot. He didn't think it was flattering or something. No, no, he said it was his. He, he claimed it was personal property. Oh yeah, right. and it's not personal property. Right. It's property of the state. Of course, of course right? Yeah. So right. he complained to GoDaddy, and GoDaddy took my website down for like seventy two hours. And eventually when I got an explanation, they were just like, yeah, this Mr. Mancuso thinks that. And I'm like, so you just, on his word, you shut down my website? Right. Uh, And I said, I did not take a personal photo of Mr. Mancuso. That's not a personal photo. Mm -hmm. That's a prison photo. Right. Um, Which means public domain. Right. So it eventually got back up and running. But it was just, I was flabbergasted when I talked to the... Uh, GoDaddy people, and they told me who this complaint came from. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember that now. Now when you mention that, so he, so he's he, he's kind he, of a miserable person. So he rose, th- he rose through the ranks, starts off, and then, um, and th- because there was so much, the fallout of Messino going down, there was so much, as you point out, dysfunction, and it seems like it's just this uh, 
revolving door of, of different bosses, street bosses, under bosses, and the Bananos, because as soon as a guy becomes the acting boss or whatever, it's only a matter of time before he gets indicted or with, like, Sal Montagna, he gets, he gets extradited and then uh, – or not extradited, but he gets deported and then he gets killed. And then, um, you know, obviously Bastiano went down. Uh, I'm Camarano looking, didn't last long. Um, I, I'm I'm probably missing some people. Vinny, too uh, Vinny were, Battleman. Vinny oh right, he Vinny was. TV. Yeah, he was. He was there at some point. Um, I'm looking at something right now, and this is coming from the internet, so <laughs> you know you can't trust everything you find on a, on a Google search. But uh, this is telling me here that uh, at some point when Bastiano was in prison, he was upset with what Mancuso was doing as. Uh, acting boss, and he tried to put a contract on him. Wow! So maybe that might, maybe that speaks to why um, Mikey Mancuso wasn't responding. It doesn't give a shit. Wasn't but... responding to Vinny Bashano. I hadn't seen that before. So. Well, it, you know, one thing it's, it's interesting with the Bananos is right. They, so they had a reputation for being dysfunctional, going all the way back to the banana split in the '60s, right? And uh, where Joe Bonanno, you know, is that's where he gets back to our original conversation. He gets exiled to Arizona. And there was a civil war. And then um, there was the, you know, the tension between is it Rastali, is it is it Carmine Galante? We've, you know, we've had episodes where we've talked about that. And then when Messino f- officially takes over, there was actually a period of stability for a while with he the sta- Bananos. No, he did stabilize the crime family. And for about 10 years, Messino became the most powerful yeah. mafia boss in New York. Yeah. And the Bananos became, for a, f- a flash in the pan, right. they became kind of the Ivy League of, That's right. of, of crime families like the Genovese. Right. And there, so there was like this irony that, and, and part of that was because the Bananos were so dysfunctional that law enforcement started this devote fewer and fewer resources to, to and that the, family. And the commission <laughs> booted them. Right, right. So they weren't on the radar of the So feds. by the mid-'80s, the, the other five family or the other four families in right. the five families were so disgusted with the Bonanno, they said, we don't want you a part of our commission anymore. Right. You've lost your seat. Which M- Messino used that to his advantage yeah. because he could do things and he wasn't under the same scrutiny. His family wasn't under the same and scrutiny. And then he brought the commission back together. Right. Right. And then and then now history repeats itself. Once he's taken down, it's back to um, at least for several years now. So the boss back to the dysfunction junction. The bosses between uh, Bastiano and Mancuso were Sal the Iron Worker. Yeah. Um, the the uh, baby boss, Bambino boss. Yeah. Another Castellamarese. Uh, the Iron Worker uh, who went to Canada, got caught up in all of their uh, power struggles and ended up uh, being murdered. Vinny TV, Battlemente. And then uh, uh, Nose, Mikey Nose took over, but a big chunk of his uh, early years was was spent in prison through acting bosses like Tommy DeFori, Johnny Palazzolo, and then Joe Saunders Jr. Yeah, or Little Joe Saunders, right. um, which did which led to the the, the acrimony thing. that we have right now. Another thing I I should point out uh, that Mancuso was implicated, although never charged. In the George from Canada murder. Wow. Hmm. As being a part of the conspiracy. Right. That was, we know Messino called the shots on that. Yeah. Which in some ways was the beginning of the end for yeah. Messino because George from Canada was so popular. Right. And it, a lot of the rank and file felt that that was, was unnecessary. A, he overstepped. He overstepped. And um, so in a lot of ways that, that, that was, Messino was guilty for think- starting the destabilization process. <laughs> In a family that he had actually stabilized right. for a while, ironically. Messino's downfall was his insecurity. Uh, I think he, he had this opinion that too, that too many people around him were, were um, including his brother-in-law, mm-hmm. uh, Salvatore Vitale, were too big for their britches. And, and that, you know, there, there was the story that... Um, one of the reasons that George from Canada got killed was because he made a comment to Messino about Messino's choice of consigliere, Tony Graziano, TG. TG was known to indulge in, in drug use mm-hmm. and uh, was known to uh, snort cocaine and uh, would show up, I guess, at meetings. The opinion of the other members of the uh, participants in these meetings was that, that, t- that TG was high. Mm-hmm. And uh, George from Canada in early 1999 
questioned Messino's judgment at naming him the number three and said to Messino, you got a cokehead as your conciliary. Yeah. Now, whether that was true or not, Messino took offense to it right. and said, it's none of your business. Yeah, I'm not asking your opinion. It's none of your business who my conciliary is. Right. But right. I think that was an example of how he thought George was gaining the, he was gaining influence to the point where he felt it was okay to make a, po- or make a policy advisement to the boss. Right. And, and by the way, another aspect of not only destabilizing his own family by killing a popular person over something that was probably not, it, the punishment didn't fit the crime. But then that alienated him from Montreal, his biggest right. earner, his biggest. Well, no, it turned, then that, that led to Montreal breaking off. <laughs> right, right, right. And like you said, that was a big uh, piece of the machine. Yeah, revenue stream. For, year, for years, right. for half half century. <laughs> right, right. So that wasn't and smart. And Vito Rizzuto said at that point, oh, you're going to kill our guys. Right. Uh, we don't need you anymore. That's right. Yeah. And then at a certain point in the early 2000s, I think Massino sent some guys up to Montreal and uh, – said something along the lines of, uh, you know, you guys have to ask us permission to do X, Y, and Z. To make guys, I think. And Rizzuto like sent word back like, hey, no, I don't anymore. No, right. They used to see we're, it. We're, we're on our own. Yeah, we're our own family now. So, yeah, it's it's a dysfunctional tale. But let, let me ask you one uh, one thing, and I'm not sure we're at on time if we need to wrap up. We'll but, wrap it up. Um, in terms of what does this portend? So does do you think this is going to – have something in the bananas where other guys who are paying protection money are going to start as in the, in the underworld, the term is like stand up. Like you can't shake me down anymore because I'm not getting anything. I'm not getting anything for, remember uh step, rem, remember Beansy and Beansy and, uh, and, and Rich, right? Rich right. Right. He says, I'm, I'll step up, <laughs> which that doesn't go well. He's that a shopping well. cart. Right. That doesn't go well for him. <laughs> although, although Beansy ends up having the last laugh, but he's, he's not, he's not in very I good lo- shape. I, lo- I, I mean, I don't love it, but it's, it's such a great uh, line where he says, yeah, yeah, Beansy might never walk again. He's like, no, there's, there's no might never walk again. He ain't never, he's a shopping cart. Right. He ain't right. never going to walk again. So are there going to be guys, is this going to trickle through that world and people are going to say why if you if you own a small a small business in the Italian neighborhood whatever you're paying extortion money are there going to be guys saying why am i paying this if they couldn't protect i would if they couldn't protect Sally D who's as about as connected as it comes to the former boss yeah. they can't protect him or are they going to say look this is a this was a family feud it was out of our there was nothing we could do about it the son killed the father. Like this isn't normal operating procedure. What, what's going to be the yeah, sense but, on the streets? But if you're the, if you're on the street, I think your belief is what my belief is: is that a it doesn't matter where it was coming from, and b I, I don't think we give Mancuso the benefit of the doubt that he knew this was coming from uh, within right. Sally Daz's he own just didn't family. Care. He just didn't care. Yeah. Uh, so I think, yeah, if I'm someone who's paying protection, uh, I'd be going to the guy that, I, that I'm paying and having these conversations. Like when the shit hits the fan and I need you guys, are you going to be there or am I going to get caught in a, a drive through line at McDonald's and get my head blown off? Yeah. And, and it, so then it could also set up this thing where like – Call that a McMurder. <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> and the uh, – um, so if you're paying protection money to a guy who's not part of Mancuso's inner circle, right. you might be thinking, "I ain't getting anything. I'm not going to get anything for my any return on my." Now, the trickle down <laughs> from these last two uh, revelations with Mikey knows is uh, toxic, and you know my prediction. And I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of go out on a limb here and uh, kind of be bold in what I what I foresee happening over these next couple of years. Um, you know, I foresee. Mikey Mancuso being removed. Mm. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, and maybe he, he he rules for the next ten years, fifteen years, and dies a, a free man or or what have you. I know he just got violated uh, a couple months ago. Yeah, for, for meeting with mobsters, he wasn't right. supposed to be meeting. The violation with. of his parole. He got right. paroled in nineteen, and then uh, got violated uh, in, in the winter. Um, but I, I I can only imagine the kind of conversations that are being had within the rank and file right now. You know, whether or not you're a, a supporter of, of uh, Little Joe C or not, 
Uh, I just don't think either of these situations bodes well for looking into the future and, and feeling confident that Mikey Mancuso is the, is the guy to lead the Bananos um, going forward. Well, there could be a situation where or this is another sign of the dysfunction, but also maybe just a, a sign of the times in general. There may be some guys who are like, Fuck it, let him let him think he's the boss because there's too much there's too much heat. We've already got heat now. I mean, there's already heat now. I mean, right. if there wasn't heat before, there's right. heat now. Right. So let him let him be the bo- let him. What does Tony say? I always go back to Sopranos about yeah. Junior. He says something. Let let him take the. I can't remember the like, lightning rod. Like, or yeah, whatever whatever term. So there might be where guys are just like it's it's too there's too much heat to be the boss. Let oh. Mancuso be the the for for um, whatever it's worth. Let him be the boss. And that might be a way he hangs on. I'm saying if at, if, if he does look for Vinny Battlementi, you know, in my in my opinion, as a guy that could eventually uh, take back the family, because I, I know that uh, you know he's he's no longer the boss now, but uh, and he was only boss for a couple of years in an acting capacity. But I think he's someone that uh, could potentially fill the void if that family decides to go away from Mancuso, or if uh, he gets sent back to prison for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, he's, you know, a final word on this is kind of what you see is what you get. Whenever you've seen pictures of Mikey Knows Mancuso, it reminds me a little bit of Tony Giacalone. Just the guy never has a smile on his face. Oh, yeah. He it's, looks it, like a mean guy. Yeah, he's just always kind of snarling. And it's like I've always, th- whenever I see those type of guys, it's like, what's the point of being a mobster if you're not having fun? I mean, yeah. have as much fun as you can because you're going to end up dead or in prison at the end of your life. So, you know, I, I always kind of have a modicum of respect for the Vinnie Bastianos or the Joey Merlino. Skinny Joey. He look, always just, looks like it's the just, best day of yeah, his life or, every time you see him. <laughs> and even Messina was, Messina was like that. Messina yeah. was someone that was uh, jovial and would, you know, talk to people and um, not... Yeah. Uh, uh, it, rem- it reminds me a little bit of um, in the '80s. There was footage of um, in Chicago and in Cleveland during the the, the casino skimming busts, where uh, Joey Iupa and um, Jack uh, Jack White Licavoli are like going after cameramen with their <laughs> with their canes. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, and even we were talking about at the beginning of the episode, Joe Bonanno. You know the namesake of this family. He always he always looked like a million bucks in the yeah. in the picture. He always looked like he was having the best day, no matter what, no matter how bad things were. He always looked like kept his composure and looked like. But I do I do have to say I do I do think it's funny. One of my favorite clips is, I think it was during the commission case in the eighties when. Fat Tony Salerno gets in the car and the guy says, do you have any words for us? He goes, yeah, go fuck yourself. (laughs) Or the Tony Giacalone after the 96 post. Uh, The government says that you're the boss of the Detroit Mafia. Is that true? Your mother is. Yeah, right. (laughs) So I do it. I guess I do admit, I guess there's room for, we can be pluralist here. There's room for all sorts of personalities uh, in in this world because some of those guys who are more of a sourpuss, they they can be, have some amusing sound bites too. So, Um, well, anyhow, uh, Want to wrap up? Yeah. All right. So thanks for listening and uh, keep on uh, following us, please, on social media and spread the word. That's really helpful is um, each day we get comments like, oh, we're just discovering your podcast. I mean, we've been doing this for what, four years now, but some people are still new and we appreciate that. And if you are new, especially on video, go back and check out some of our audio episodes because I, I think there's still some confusion out there. Um, people are asking for some of the, the audio episodes. Uh, why can't we see these on YouTube? Well, it's because they weren't they weren't, they weren't video, video recorded. recorded yeah. So uh, there's some really good content there and, and listen to it That's on audio. That's why Benny's our MVP. That's right, yeah. We're, MVP. We're, we're trying to join MVP. The, <laughs> the, uh, the, the new age here. So anyhow, thanks for listening. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato. Scott Bernstein. We're out. <laughs>